I'm serious about that one. Um, all right. So yesterday was kind of a catch up day, right? Get everything in, finish up last week's lab, any outstanding assignments you had. Um, that's going to be the plan with Tuesdays moving forward. Um, anything that you haven't turned in yet, anything that you need to finish, finish up in terms of your lab from the week before. Um, if you missed lab the week before, and it's a it's one that can be made up, um, which is going to be most of them, unless we're dealing with particularly dangerous chemicals or something like that. Um, most of the labs can be made up and we'll that the schedule for that will be on Tuesdays. Um, so we won't have very many like um, unless I feel like everybody's gotten all the way caught up and we're getting behind or something. I'm not going to assign new assignments for Tuesdays anymore. It's it's time to get everything caught up, ask questions, finish up labs. Does that sound reasonable? Yeah. Um, and then, and like I said, make up last week's lab if you needed to miss, like, I know there's a bunch of you that are missing to, uh, tomorrow for sports and stuff. Um, so next Tuesday would be your chance to, to make it up and get that data. Um, and the lab will be due next Thursday. So you'll have less time to finish and answer the questions if you do that. So you're gonna wanna make sure you know what's going on and and get get help as well. Um, if it's, if, if that really winds up being unreasonable to try and finish that, then we can talk about it and and maybe um, get an extension on those. But for the most part, that's the plan. Cool? Cool. Um, so today we're just going to, we didn't get quite as far. I'm, I'm still really getting used to this whole hour and 15 minute lectures. Um, I'm used to doing two hour lectures with a 10 minute break in the middle. And so I don't, I don't ever get as far as I think I should in these hour and 15 minute lectures. Um, so we're going to, today, what we're going to do is do a bunch of practice um, with the calculations that you'll need for tomorrow's lab. So it'll be a little bit of a lecture and then a bunch of just practice problems um, with, with energy units and things like that. All right. So uh, this is where we left off on Monday, right? Um, we talked about random energy units like tons of TNT or barrels of oil equivalent. Um, kilowatt hours, therms. Um, I also included this table because I think this is a really interesting table. Um, it may be a little outdated at this point since this is, was from 2012. Um, some of these numbers don't mean so. This is kind of cool because this, this might be your first experience with a logarithmic scale. Does anybody? Has anybody ever uh, done any graphs or seen any graphs with a log scale instead of a regular scale? Does anybody know anything that go that works according to a log scale rather than a regular base 10? So exponential growth, a lot of times we'll plot it on a log scale. Turns out if you take exponential growth, like population growth, if you put it on a log scale, which and a log scale just means that instead of um, if you go from one to two on the log scale, that's increasing by a factor of 10. So every time you go up one unit on a log scale, it's 10 times greater than the number below it. So uh, population growth follows that. And if you plot population growth, if you make the y-axis on a chart, a log scale, um, population growth looks like a straight line. But there's other there's other things that um, there's actual units that are log log based as well. Anybody think of any of those? What's that? Sorry, finished chewing. Um, so I was thinking more like like the Richter scale for earthquakes, right? A a six point oh is ten times greater than a five point oh. And a 7.0 is 10 times greater than a 6.0. pH. pH. If you've had, if you've done pH, right, you had to take the negative log of, of concentration, right? Um, the other one that's kind of weird, um, which I think it's, and I, it's been a very long time since I had physics, so I might be wrong on this, but I believe decibels is a log scale as well. It's exponential. It's not log based. Okay. Right. Um, but that also gets funny because perceived loudness is based on how far away you are 
as an inverse square. So sound gets weird that way, but decibels technically is also a similar type of scale. Um, so this is a log-based scale right here, meaning it goes up by factors of 10. Um, so this is the energy needed for various things in, in terms of joules. The energy used to sleep one hour. You actually expend energy when you're sleeping, right? You have a basal metabolic rate for your body. You expend about 10 to the 5 joules per hour that you're asleep. Um, one factor above that, so 10 to the 6, which now we're, we went from 10 to the 5 is 100,000, right? 10 to the 6 is a million. It takes a million joules if you're going to bicycle for one hour. If you're going to, and really exercise for an hour in general, is about a million joules. Um, also, that's about the same energy that you need, that you get from a donut or one serving of pasta. Um, so now we're getting into the, the nutrition range. When you get past that, it's kind of interesting. 10 to the 8 is the energy from one gallon of gasoline. So one gallon of gasoline has a hundred times more energy than a serving of pasta, which seems kind of weird to think about. We just Gasoline would actually be a really, really efficient way to power our bodies if our digestive system was built for that, um, which is one of the reasons why it's been so hard for humanity to get off of fossil fuels. They're really, really energy dense compared to pretty much anything else. Um, if you go further up, energy use per person in one year in the US, 10 to the 11th. So 10 to the sixth is a million, 10 to the nine is a billion. So we're at like 100 billion joules used per person in the US on average, uh, which, I guess this isn't a super useful graph. It's just kind of fun to put things into context, how big some of these numbers are. Um, solar energy reaching the Earth per second. We're at 10 to the 17th now. So in other words, we're 10 to the 6th times bigger, where a million times more energy hits the Earth from the sun than is used by one person in the U.S. So we could actually do some conversions. We could figure out how much, um, how much energy... It takes for all of the US from that and compare it to that 10 to the 17th number. Or we could look one step up here, 10 to the 20th. Energy consumption for one year in the US is 10 to the 20th. It's a thousand times more energy used per year in the US than the energy that reaches the earth per second. So in other words, it would only take a thousand seconds if we harvested all of the energy that hits the earth from the sun and turned it into electricity, it would take a thousand seconds to power the US for an entire year. Um, thing is that's not really very practical though, right? That's assuming we could actually get all of that energy and then that we could turn all of that energy into electricity or into a usable form effectively. Um, and it really is not very efficient photovoltaics are are pretty good these days by which i mean solar panels um but you're still there's still a, a hard limit if you actually run the numbers um if you build a solar cell that was perfect you could still only get about 33 percent of the energy that hits the earth to turn into electricity um just based on the energy levels of the photons um so it wouldn't really be very effective or we couldn't actually get all, all of thousand wow. seconds worth of energy at once. Um, if solar energy reaches the earth per second is 10 to the 17, energy rated by the sun per second though is 10 to the 26th, which is a billion times greater, right? 10 to the nine times greater. Why is energy radi radiated by the sun a billion times greater than the energy that hits the earth per second? Because the Earth doesn't take up all of the area around the sun, right? We don't encapsulate the entire sun. So uh, we can't actually get all of that energy. Per but that is really kind of impressive. 10 to the 26, a billion times more energy. Um, or a million times more energy 
is released per second from the sun than the U.S. uses in an entire year, which is kind of wild. Um, has anybody ever heard of a Dyson sphere? A few people, those, those of you who read sci-fi, um, a Dyson sphere is, is postulated, Dyson was a physicist um, who, who postulated that if you have um, a super advanced civilization, the logical, um, the logical end point for that civilization is to not lose that billion, that extra billion times of energy from the sun. Um, so why not just build a structure that encapsulates the sun and then you get all of that instead of just getting one billionth of it. Um, and so the Dyson sphere is the, is basically a structure that a theoretical structure um, would be really, really impossible with our logistics at this point, especially to ever build where you basically surround a sun with an, a structure and then everybody lives on the inside of that structure. So you turn all of that, a giant inside of a giant sphere into one giant, one big surface for people to live, um, or at least where you can collect the energy. Um, so that's actually one thing that SETI, the search for extraterrestrial intelligence looks for is hot spots where there is no sun. Because in theory, you could have, it could still, it would still be hot, but you wouldn't be able to see the sun in the visible spectrum anymore. If they ever found something like that, that would indicate maybe some civilization was able to build one of these weird Dyson spheres. Um, anyway, just interesting, interesting theory. Scscientists like to talk about extraterrestrial life and like what might be plausible, um, which I always find really interesting too. The other the part of the reason that that'd be super impractical is it would take so much mass to do that, more mass than the entire solar system has um but that then you get into well what if you made it a ring instead you still increase the amount of area you have if you build something like the the um ring from the video game halo um is basically like a, a strip instead of having a planet that goes around you just have a ribbon that goes around the sun it still would increase your mass or your um area by a lot you would only take something if you run the numbers something about the mass of jupiter um if you could convert that into usable elements, you could turn that, you could build something in theory. Yeah, yeah, no big deal, right? All right, so when we're talking about calculations for energy, we're mostly gonna be talking about heat. Um, because for the most part, heat is how we're going to measure whether or not energy is changing hands. So in physics, you can look at something like, okay, a bowling ball is moving at this rate and then it hits a golf ball and the golf ball moves off at this speed. How much energy was transferred to the golf ball? Um, and that works for physics, except that we measure kinetic energy in the form of temperature, right? Because we're dealing with molecules now. Um, so we use this equation that I usually just call the heat equation um, because heat actually is not the same as temperature. We think about things like, oh, it's, it's really hot, it's got a lot of heat. Heat is not something that an object has. Heat by definition is a change in energy. When energy changes hands, but from one object to another object, if there's a temperature change, then there is heat. Um, don't even usually need to say heat transfer because heat by its definition, Q in this equation stands for heat. And so the heat that changes hands, we can actually measure by looking at a couple of variables. One is how big is the object? Two is how much temperature did it change? Did the temperature change? And then the third one, CP, is this, this term that basically relates to how easy is it to change that substance's temperature? Uh, has anybody ever picked up a penny that's been sitting in the, in the sun in the middle of summer? It burns your hand for a second, right? But you could leave, say, oh, what's another good example? Um, you leave like anything else, for whatever reason, pennies burn your hand, but other coins less so, right? Or even like a rock 
that's been sitting right next to the penny. That's the same temperature as the penny. The rock doesn't burn your hand, right? But the penny does. That has to do with the specific heat of copper versus the rock is different, right? So specific heat by definition is it, it's the measure of the amount of energy that raises one gram of a substance by one degree Celsius. So something with a high specific heat means it takes a lot of energy to get it to change temperature. If it has a low specific heat, it's very easy to get it to change temperature. My copper analogy is not perfect because that actually has to do with the rate of heat transfer, which is related to specific heat, but technically a little bit different. Um, but in general, that's what that CP term means. How much energy does it take to change temperature by one degree? All right. And that means that this is a pretty straightforward equation if you know what all those letters mean, which is a big if. We'll get used to it. You should start to learn to recognize them. Q is going to be an energy term. It's always going to be energy units. M is mass, usually in grams, but you want to check some of your other numbers to see what the units are. Delta T was, how many of you have used delta in, a, in an equation before? Most staff. Delta is just shorthand in the sciences for change in. So a capital delta specifically. So delta T literally means change in temperature, which mathematically um, we can represent as Final temperature minus initial temperature. Now remember, don't get bogged down by these um, subscripts. They're just a way to keep, keep track of what temperature are we talking about. TF is final temperature. TI is initial temperature. And delta mathematically always gets written as final minus initial, right? Conceptually, it means change in. So you can have you can have delta anything really at any time you've got a change in a variable, you can put a delta in front of it to represent that change. Just to make another point real quick, what's this? Lowercase versus uppercase matters when it comes to chemistry, especially, but physics as well. Chemistry, we get really, really specific about it because periodic table has, you have to be very, very specific, whether it's an uppercase or a lowercase letter to indicate if it's um, what the symbol for that element is. Um, but also for the variables and also for units, always be very, very careful with your capitalization. This is change in time. This is change in temperature. Um, what's another good, oh, how about if I write a unit, if I, if I write 16 mm, what is that? Millimeters, right? What if I write 16 mm? That's megameters, which means, so millimeter is a thousandth of a meter, a megameter is one million meters, right? Or in other words, a thousand kilometers. So keeping track of your capitalization, be careful with that. I'll keep reminding you, but especially there will likely be some labs where we deal both with Delta T and with Delta T. It's really easy to confuse yourself um, if you mix up which T are you talking about, temperature or time. All right. Um, our most common units for the specific heat are going to be joules divided by grams times Celsius or calories divided by grams times Celsius, which is basically it's just the units that says exactly what's right above that. It's a measure of the energy that raises one gram of a substance one degree. So it's joules per gram per degree Celsius. 
right? Per means for every, right? So that's, that's just the unit way of representing what it says right above. Basically, it's the slope of the line. If you have, if you plot temperature on the x-axis and energy that goes into a system on the y-axis, specific heat is the slope of that line. You'll wind up with something with a straight line that looks like that, where the slope is going to be the mass times specific heat. Right. This is all useful to know. Well, maybe not useful yet, but it's it's cool to know what why is it useful? Because we can measure the mass and we can measure delta T. And for most pure substances, we can look up specific heat. So that allows us to actually put a number to how much energy changed hands. Right. And so that's what, what you're going to be doing tomorrow is you're going to heat up a piece of metal to a, to a certain temperature, basically by putting it in a hot water bath until you're sure that the metal is the same temperature as the water. This is really hard to measure the temperature of a solid, right? But it's really easy to measure the temperature of a, of a liquid just by putting a thermometer in it, right? So if you heat up the metal so it's hot, so it's the temperature of boiling water, and take that metal and you pour it into room temperature water, you can watch the temperature change of the room temperature water. And you can figure out how much energy went into the water. If you know how much energy went into the water, where did that energy come from? From the metal, right? So if, the, if you know how much energy went into the water, you know how much energy was lost by the metal, right? So, and we're gonna do practice problems with this. But what we're trying to get to, your final goal for tomorrow's lab, is to calculate the specific heat of the metal. And it, so if you know the mass of water, if you know the specific heat of water, and you know delta T of the water, you can get Q. If you know Q for the water, you also know Q for the metal, just with a negative sign, right? Because if the energy went into the water, it came from the metal. All right, let's do some practice. Wrong. That's still the wrong computer. I'm gonna keep doing that for a while. Um, so here's an example. This is actually literally the way they they used to measure um, the num the amount of calories in food. Is they would burn it, and then they would watch how the temperature changed. Burning one gram of table sugar produces 16.5 kilojoules. If all of the energy goes into a 120 gram sample of water, what is the temperature change of the water? Well, so this is written like it's a word problem, but if we know that there we have one equation that involves energy at this point, right? So if something happens with energy, you should be looking at that heat equation. Try to fill in all of these, um, the variables that you can and solve for what you're missing. So what do we know from that equation? We know the mass, we have two masses, right? We have to be careful with that. What's changing temperature? So, the equation is Q equals MCP delta T. What mass do we want to use? Water. The water is changing temperature. And one way you can avoid getting confused with that is write subscripts after everything. Subscript, I mean, by which I mean the, the little lowercase love, uh, letters to keep track of things. If we want to know, if we are looking to use this equation for the water, we want Q of the water equals mass of the water times specific heat of the water. Sometimes even your subscripts get subscripts. It's okay. 
and delta T of the water. Now that makes it look more complicated, but does that actually make it more clear from the word problem what we actually need here? What do we have from the word problem? We have mass of water. Uh, you might not be able to see it. My formatting got a little bit wonky here, but right there at the top, there's specific heat of water is 4.184 joules per gram Celsius. So mass of water is 120 grams, right? CP of water is given to us. For some reason, what else do we know? Energy, and which term is that in our equation? Q. And we're trying to solve for delta T. And so we know Q for the water is 16.5? Yeah. 0.5 kilojoules. As complicated as this looks, if we're used to dealing just with X's and Y's, there's still nothing tricky about doing algebra with this, right? Plug in what you know, solve for what you don't. Is there any other steps we have to do before we can start doing algebra? Q is the total energy that went into changing the temperature. Yes, exactly. Heat is a measure of, of energy transfer. <clears throat> Anything else we have to worry about here? We want our units to be the same, right? Our specific heat is in joules per gram degree Celsius, but the energy that we were given is in kilojoules. So we are gonna to wanna to switch that so that so that our energy is in regular joules. What's the multiplier for kilo? Thousand, right? And is a kilojoule bigger than a joule or smaller than a joule? Bigger than a joule. So how do we get this to kill from kilojoules to joules? That would make it smaller, right? Multiply by. So this is why it can be helpful to write it out like a conversion factor. We want kilojoules to cancel out. And we know one kilojoule is 10 to the three joules. And we know that this is true, right? A kilojoule is a thousand joules or at least verbally, you just said that, you might not have thought to write it out like this. This is how you keep yourself from dividing when you're supposed to multiply, is by showing the units canceling out. Kilojoules cancels kilojoules. So we're gonna multiply by a thousand. And a convenient enough way of doing that is to take that 16.5 times 10 to the third joules. Or you can rewrite it as 16,500. Everybody feeling good where we are so far? Feel like they can they can plug plug stuff in? Your math classes or any of your science classes use the term plug and chug? Yeah. It's, that's all this is. Figure out where all your numbers go and then just chug along. Do the algebra. So you're going to get 16,000 divided by 120 divided by 4.184 gives us a delta T of 33. So 120, we would normally assume. So you guys don't use this shorthand, I, I take it. So 
Um, this is not the official way. I'm kind of glad you haven't learned it that way because this is like cheating um, a little bit. But if you see ever see a number written that ends in a zero and it has a decimal place written, but no zero after the decimal place, that's saying that the uncertainty is in the ones place. Um, to, to truly avoid it being an ambiguous number, it should be 1.20 times 10 to the two. But sometimes we wind up with these cases where we just want to say, oh, well, the uncertainty is in the ones place, and rather than rewrite it in scientific notation. Some textbooks even will just use this as a shorthand. Writing out that decimal place means the uncertainty is here. Because if we wrote, if we wrote it like that, then it's really clear what the uncertainty is, right? And if we don't write that, now that's in, ambiguous. We don't know whether that's plus or minus 10 or plus or minus one, right? That's what we talked about on Monday a little bit. This is just a shortcut to show that it's plus or minus one. So let's call it, let's say we get to keep three sig figs instead of two. And it's what? 32.9. What happened with our units when we did that? I didn't show the units for the algebra, but we should probably do that, right? We had one or 16.5 times 10 to the third joules divided by 4.184 joules per gram degree Celsius divided by 120 grams. We've got joules on top and bottom, right? So joules cancel out. This one, if we just look at the denominator and multiplying across on the denominator, we have grams canceling out grams, right? So we actually wind up with, for our um, 32.9, one over one over degrees Celsius, which is weird, right? How do you divide fractions? If you were, go back to, I don't know, fifth grade, whenever you first learned multiplying and dividing fractions, how do you divide fractions? You multiply by the reciprocal, right? So if we say, take the top one, and we're going to divide by one over Celsius, which is the same as saying one times Celsius over one. Right, so anytime you wind up with units where it's one over one over something, you're flipping the reciprocal twice. So you can just say Celsius. So everybody in here is fresh enough on, on um, their math that that seems natural or you've seen that before. Um, when I teach this at the college, a lot of times I have people taking this class that haven't had a math class in five or six years. And the idea of multiplying fractions and that you can do that with units is really, really new to them or like so buried in their repressed traumatic memories from high school that that's something that we have to spend some time on. But it seemed like that was pretty straightforward for everybody, most people. That's kind of cool. Burning one gram of sugar with a hundred, what does 120 grams of water look like? Roughly. It's 120 milliliters, probably half of that. It's probably about 250, maybe 300. So it's enough to raise it 32 degrees Celsius. That's fairly significant, right? One gram of sugar. It's, that'd be warm. Turns out food and sugar has a lot of energy in it, which is why we eat that. If we burned one gram of gasoline, it'd be even more though. I'd have to look up what the entropy of combustion is for it for gasoline, but it'd probably be about double that. Yeah, about that, about double that. So this is even a simpler question, but you might have to think about it. How many kilocalories are in one gram of sugar? 
So remember we talked, were you here? You weren't here on Monday, right? All right. So kilocalories mean is nutritional calories, right? So a regular calorie is the energy to raise one gram of sugar, one or one gram of sugar, one gram of water, one degree Celsius. A kilocalorie is a nutritional calorie. It's what we think of when we're eating food. What do you need to answer this question from the word problem? How many kilojoules? So this is just a straightforward conversion question. It gives you how many kilojoules there are and then asks you how many kilocalories that is. So 16.5 kilojoules, we just wanna convert that to kilocalories. Anybody remember the conversion for joules to calories? We just did that on Monday and I only mentioned it once, but 4.184, how convenient. It's the same as specific heat, right? Because remember calories, what's this, the specific heat of water in calories is one. So that's the definition of a calorie is how much energy does it take to raise one gram of water, one degree Celsius, right? So the specific heat of water actually tells you what that conversion is, or go to your handy conversion sheet. 16.5 kilojoules. We wanna to get to kilocalories. How do we do that? What conversion factors would we need to use? Don't overthink it. Yeah, go from kilojoules to joules. We already did that once, right? <laughs> then what do we need to do? Joules to calories. We have that conversion, right? 4.184 joules is one calorie. Last step. Calories to cake house. Get about four, right? Do you notice anything about those conversions? Yeah, the 10 to the third gets canceled out, right? So as a shortcut, when you're using those metric prefixes, if you're starting from the same prefix and ending with the same prefix, they're gonna cancel out. So going from kilojoules to joules and then going from calories to kcals, you multiply by a thousand, then you divide by a thousand. So you really could say, you could also, write this conversion as it, you can apply that multiplier to both sides. So you can say 4.184 kilojoules equals one kcal. Anytime you're gonna apply the same prefix to both sides of an existing conversion, that can shorten your steps. Or when in doubt, just do it the long way. So you had to do a little extra writing, but if you're, if this way makes sense to you, stick with doing it this way. Jasper Lilly here. All right, thank you. All right. bring it back is so is there anything tricky about this heat equation really no two things that are easy to measure two things that aren't as easy to measure but this 4.184 number that's going to show up everywhere because specific heat of water 
is used as a known all the time, right? So I'm going to give you a set of data and describe the situation that you're going to do in lab tomorrow and we'll walk through the calculations. Because this is another case of you're going to need to keep track. You're going to have two different masses and two different temperatures and two different specific heats. We're going to need to keep track of all those to make sure we don't mix things up. But I started by describing what we're doing in lab tomorrow so that you could let that marinate a little bit. And now we'll describe it again. And we're going to do a question very much like this. That's going to be the identical to what you do tomorrow. So let's say let's, I'm, I'm trying to make give us reasonable numbers, um, but also make them up off the top of my head, which is always tricky with this. Um, all right, let's say we have say 25 grams of water in our so this this process right here is called calorimetry. Uh, calor in Latin literally means heat or temperature. Um, metry means measure, right? Here's our really, really fancy calorimeter. We're going to take our fancy calorimeter and we're going to put, let's say, we're going to have a mass of water in the bottom that's, a, we'll call it 32.15 grams. And we measure the initial temperature of that water. And it's room temperature. So somebody throw out a number. What's a reasonable room temperature in Celsius? 27? No. That'd be a little bit hot. That'd be pretty warm. 21, 22. Let's call it 21.5. No. I think 21 is 68 Fahrenheit. So that's a nice room temperature right there. 28 would be a little bit warm. To this sample of water in our fancy calorimeter, we're going to add some hot copper. And the mass of the copper let's say it's going to be let's call it about 50 grams. Let's say 48.25 grams. To give us some sig figs. And before we dump the cop copper in our fancy calorimeter, we just pulled it out of the boiling water bath. So we're going to assume it's the same temperature as the boiling water. What temperature does water boil up here? It's, it's a bigger difference than you think. It's more like 94. 94 Celsius. So let's say our initial temperature of the copper is... Call it 94.2 Celsius. So we take our copper sample, we add it to our room temperature water, and then we watch the temperature of our room temperature water. And what's gonna happen to the temperature of the water? It's gonna go up, right? And let's say when we're measuring this, we wind up with the final temperature of the water. Let's say it's gonna go up to 22.8 uh, degrees Celsius. And we know the specific heat of water because it's water and that's one of our givens. How much energy went into the water?
how do we get how do we get the energy that went into the water? Yeah, you can, or you can actually leave it like that because remember, delta T can also be written as final minus initial, right? So we could actually just plug it in. Q for the water is equal to mass of water, so 32.15 grams times 4.184 joules per gram degree Celsius. And then delta T, we could either do the subtraction first and then plug it in, or you can plug in final minus initial. 22.8 degrees Celsius minus 21.5 degrees Celsius. Don't even have to do any algebra in this case, right? Unless you count substituting in for a variable algebra. That gives us 1.3. That's going to give us about four and a half times 32. Four and a half times 30 would be what, 150? Somewhere in there? 174? 175 if we're going to, to three sig figs. How many sig figs do we get to keep though? We made it a little tricky by doing our substitution like this, right? So we have to do this first with our subtraction rules, which means we only leave, we only have two sig figs in our final answer. So 180. Or if you hadn't rounded it yet, it was 174.9, right? So technically 170. Or 1.7 times 10 to the two joules. Cool, I'm gonna rewrite that over here so we can clear some space for the next step. So Q for the H2O, 1.7 times 10 to the two joules. What's our, what are we actually trying to calculate here? What was the final goal of our lab report? Anybody remember? And that's cool and all, but but if it doesn't get us where we're going, it's not really very helpful. We want the specific heat of the metal. So our final goal is CP of copper. So from what's on the board, how can we figure that out? We know that Q of the water is related to Q of the copper, right? How, how is it related mathematically? They're equivalent almost. They're the same number, but if the water gained it, the copper lost it, right? So there's a negative sign. So Q for the copper is negative 1.7 times 10 to the two joules. Which is good, because what else is gonna be negative from this equation? Q is negative, as is delta T for the copper. The copper dropped in energy or in temperature, right? It went from 90 Celsius down to down to some lower number. So this is going to be negative too. So our negatives will wind up canceling out, which is kind of what we want. What else do we need before we can plug in and start solving? We have the mass of the copper. We have the initial temperature of the copper. What else do we need? Final temperature of the copper. How can we work that out? Yeah, so this is something that, that if you took a um, an abstract algebra class, you might actually have to do a proof to show this. Um, but we, act, we can assume 
that the final temperature of the water is the same as the final temperature of the copper, right? If you put something hot next, next to something cold, eventually everything's the same temperature, right? The cold thing warms up, the hot thing cools down and it stops transferring energy back and forth when they're the same temperature. So we also know T final for the copper is also 22.8. Now we know everything we need to solve for CP, right? Negative 1.7 times 10 to the 2 joules equals 38.25 grams times CP of copper, which is what we're solving for, times 94.2 minus 22.8 degrees Celsius. See how the negative signs will wind up canceling out? If we didn't put this as negative 1.7 times 10 to 2, we'd get a negative specific heat. If we tracked it all the way through, right? A negative specific heat is something that if you put energy into it, it gets colder, which doesn't make any sense, right? Technically, it's not a substance. You can do that. You can put energy into a system to get it to cool down um, using a process called laser cooling but you can't have any material that when you add energy to it gets cooled down. It's more of a process in that case. Yeah. Isn't it for the change temperature? Oh, sorry. I did. Yeah, that's, that's absolutely correct. Final minus initial, good catch. So what do we get for CP? I didn't need more. We got 16. We do get, yeah, we only have two sig figs. Joules per gram degree Celsius. That is absolutely incorrect. Um, but that's my, on me making up the numbers. It seems reasonable if you did the math right. 170 divided by, well, 170 divided by. That seems more reasonable. Yeah. So for a reasonableness check, every time you plug a number into a calculator, you want to know approximately what it's going to be before you hit enter, right? This is 170. That's about 40. Four-ish. Call that if you called that 160 divided by 40, it would be four, right? So it's gonna be that's about four. And then we're gonna divide four by another 70-ish. So it should be a number significantly less than one. If you for that 16 number, I would wager you forgot parentheses around this. Forgot to do the subtraction first. Um but there are a lot of ways you can mess up the, the algebra that might give you a different number. All right, or you slipped a decimal place and you plugged in 1700 instead of 170. So 0 0.06. Yeah, how many sig figs do we get to keep? Two sig figs, does that count? Leading zeros never count. Because that zero is just there to tell you where the decimal place goes, right? So that's our first sig fig, so we need one more. 0 0.062 joules per gram degree Celsius. When I say leading zeros, that doesn't mean zeros left of the decimal. It means zeros left of the first non-zero number. The six is the first non-zero number. So that zero doesn't count as a sig fig. What 
now I'm actually a lot happier with the numbers that I picked because I think copper is about 0.08. So for making it up off the top of my head, I don't think I did that badly. Somebody who has a computer um, off Google, Google the specific heat of copper real quick. Let's see what we get. Actually, I have it right in front of me. Oh no, 0.38. That's off by factor of five. Oopsie daisy. I'm still calling that not half bad. All right, so does everybody vaguely understand? You're going to get another chance to do this yourself with real numbers tomorrow. It's going to be the same process. The trick here is going to be keeping your masses separate and keeping your temperatures separate, temperature of copper versus temperature of water. And that gets even harder because you're going to measure the temperature of copper by measuring the temperature of the hot water. So you need to pay attention. Okay, I'm, I'm measuring the temperature of my hot water bath, but really that's the temperature of the copper when I, when I dump it in, right? Otherwise, you're going to wind up with two different shells for water, and you're going to wind up with water being, being ever, everywhere, and you're going to confuse yourself. Right, so keep track of temperature of what, mass of what. And then it's just a matter of remembering that Q of the copper equals negative Q of the water. Done in two minutes? Is that right? 22. Oh, 22 minutes. Oh, fun. Nice. Okay, good. So I have, I have another good one. Let's do some more fun. Let's say, so let's do the process that I tried to do in my head. I tried to estimate in my head to make up numbers for this, right? If you know the specific heat of copper now, we just looked it up, 0 0.38. Let's go the other way. Let's find the final temperature. If you know the initial temperature of copper and water, and you know the mass of copper and the mass of water. So I'll write it out as a as a word problem. And then I'm going to let you all see if you can figure out how to solve it as in uh, small groups. Uh, let's see. Let's call it 19.25 grams of copper heated. Ariel Lazell, we need you to report to the bus, please. Ariel Lazell, please report. And we'll go to higher temperature. Let's go to uh, 123.4 degrees Celsius is added to, let's say, we'll go with the same, roughly the same 25.21 grams of water at 21.5 degrees Celsius. What is the final temperature of the copper, which should be the same as the final temperature of the water, right? CP for water is our 4.184. And CP for copper, 0 0.38. Yeah. This one's a little bit more interesting from an algebra perspective.
Remember your Q for the water is going to be negative Q for the copper. And what is Q? The energy transferred. And mathematically, what is Q? MCP delta T, right? Does final temperature show up in that equation? Not the way it's written there, but yes, right? Not if you know it's the same but opposite sign. So instead of what we did before is we solved for Q for the water, right? And then we plugged that number in as, as negative Q for the copper. Well, we don't have to plug it in though, do we? We could plug in MCP delta T for water here and MCP delta T for copper here. And then it doesn't actually matter what the number is for Q. The trick here is to do the substitution so that you don't actually need the number for Q for water. I'll show you what I mean. Because Q for the water is the same as mass of the water, CP for the water, delta T for the water, And that's equal to negative Q for the copper, which is equal to mass of copper. So negative mass of copper times CP for copper, delta T for copper. <laughs> which means, was that the transitive property? Who's taking their math more recently? Everybody's taking their math more recently than me, but I believe that's the transitive property. If A equals B and B equals C and C equals D, then A equals D. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, Still doesn't have T final in there unless we fill this in the long form way, right? Now that doesn't look like a particularly fun algebra expression. It's actually less writing when you start filling in numbers, but it's not one that's hard to solve. You've got TF on both sides, right? And you know every other number on both sides, right? If you wanted to make it look simpler, you could distribute that negative sign and get a T initial minus T final, but then that makes it not delta T anymore and it looks weird. So you can understand, I, this is this is effectively what I was trying to do in my head while also not remembering what the specific heat of copper was, um, and which is why I was pretty happy I was only off by a factor of five for our, the numbers I made up earlier. Twenty five point two one grams of water goes here. Four point one eight four goes here. TF is what we're looking for. Twenty one point five goes here. 19.25 goes here. 0 0.38 joules per gram Celsius goes here. TF is what we're looking for. Temperature initial of copper or 123.4 goes here.
also good algebra review, right? You can have to combine like terms, distribute, move stuff around. It's all just numbers though, other than TF. This is why you should never ask your algebra teacher, when, are, when am I ever going to use this in the real world? Because this is the sort of question he could give you then. But this is an application of algebra in the world. How often do you actually need to do this? I mean, not that often, but this is actually exactly what the calculation that you have to do if you're brewing beer and you want to mash at a certain temperature you, and you have to barley with a certain specific heat being added to hot water at a with a certain specific heat and you want it to end up at a certain final temperature you have to figure out what temperature your initial your initial temperature for the water is in order to do that you don't have to do it by hand there's calculators now but this is exactly the math that goes into that add something cold to something hot what's the final temperature Let's see, what do we start getting get for an answer here? I guess we can walk through the algebra um, for anybody who struggles with the algebra side of things. 25 times four is gonna give you something right around 100, right? What is it? Once we get everything plugged in and we start doing the algebra, I'm okay with you not showing the units for the sake of saving some space and time because we know what the units were when we started and we know most everything's going to cancel out and we leave us in Celsius at the end. And then what about on the other side? 19.25 times about 0.4 is going to give us about 8. Once you cancel out units and start combining terms, it's now it doesn't look nearly as scary as a, of an algebra problem, right? Especially if you, I will, I will allow you to write that as X. I like I could actually stop you. You can write X if solving for X is less intimidating than solving for TF. Once you get to this point, you can repli replace this with X for the sake of making it look more like the math you're used to. Then what do we do on both sides? Distribute, yeah. 105, 105.0 TF minus, what about 2000? 2,257. And, Seven hundred, so eight hundred. So, what do we get for this side? Seven, seven, nine oh two. Put all your TFs on one side. Put everything else on the other side. 
So add 7.31. So 112 0.31 TF equals 3159 2000 2257 Okay. Should wind up do the do the last bit 33159 divided by 112.3. It should give you the same number you had the other way. Okay. So you got it by itself over here first before you distribute it. What do we get for final temperature? Plus rounding. Yeah. We kind of lost track of our sig figs there, but general rule of thumb if our we it's either going to be 2 or if you're unsure if you lost track somewhere you could always guess by making it the same number of decimal places as your temperatures were initially so go to the tens place but i think 2 sounds more reasonable so 28 degrees celsius is that a reasonable number that was a real relatively re real world situation i gave you right so go water going from 21 to 28 celsius that's ballpark Right. One last point. Somebody said something about I used solver once I got here. That's great. If you know how to use solver, if you want to go to Wolfram Alpha and type it in, once you get your, your algebra set up properly, that's a valid algebra step in this class as far as I'm concerned on an open book problem. You, if you get it all set up like this and then your next step is to write out the words, I used a solver. You have to say those words, but that's a valid math step for this class because this is not an algebra class. Yeah, you can use you can use um, if you have a solver on your yeah. All right, everybody, feel ready for tomorrow. Good to go. Get your data. Do this math. Not even this complicated.
Um, and if we come into a case where that doesn't work, we can tackle that then. Um, but for now, yeah, let's plan on that next next plan. So next Wednesday, you'll come in and do that. Exactly. Um, I think that makes the most sense. Okay. All right. Eric. I'm not here. Thursday, Friday, Monday. Thursday, Friday. So next Tuesday, you'll make this up. Is that all we're doing? And then the quiz um, on the weekend. And then the quiz on the weekends. And, and so, and I'm going to be lecturing on yeah. on Friday. So, but I'll record that. Speaking and of which. Monday, right? And on Monday. Um, so 